Welcome everyone to today's webinar. My name is Leila and I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network. And today's webinar is called What's New in the Treatment of Gliomas, a Neuro-Oncologist Perspective. We are very pleased to welcome our presenter for today's webinar. We're joined by Dr. Mary Jane Linsat, a neuro-oncologist at the Odette Cancer Center at Sunnybrook Hospital in Toronto. She is a graduate of the Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer Center Neuro-Oncology Fellowship Program at Harvard University and also holds a Master of Science in Epidemiology from the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. She is a clinical investigator at the University of Toronto with a special interest in developing precision medicine strategies in young adult patients with gliomas. She received the Society for Neuro-Oncology 2020 Excellence Award in Clinical Research for her work on outcomes in young adult patients with IDH mutant gliomas. In this presentation, our presenter will talk about the promising new therapeutic strategies in the treatment of gliomas with the focus on trials or therapies that will soon be available for Canadian patients. At the end of the presentation, Dr. Linsat will be able to answer your questions. However, at any time during the webinar, please feel free to type your questions into the question box in your control panel. For those of you who have not attended an earlier webinar, the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network is an organization working with cancer patients and survivors to learn about health system complexities, connect with others to plan action, and act to promote best care and healthier survivorship. If you'd like to learn more about CCSN, please visit our website at survivornet.ca. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available tomorrow on YouTube. In addition, the slides will be available on SlideShare and links to both will be sent to the email you provided. I'll now turn things over to our presenter. Welcome. Thank you, Leila, and thank you to CCSN for the opportunity to present today. Um, I know these are challenging times and many of us have added responsibilities and I hope everyone is staying safe and well. I'm very happy today to be uh, talking to you about new treatment in gliomas from my perspective as a neuro-oncologist, and I hope that it will generate some interesting discussions towards the end. So there's a lot of exciting work happening in the field of brain tumors and gliomas, but I was hoping uh, to narrow down our discussion today to three main topics uh, in the interest of time. These really focus on three areas that I'm personally very excited about. Uh, first, I wanted to discuss how our entire field has now adopted a new classification based on molecular profiling of brain tumors and discuss what impact this has had on patient care. Um, two, I wanted to review current updates in how we give radiation and chemotherapy. And three, I wanted to talk about novel approaches to gliomas and um, some that are particularly relevant to Canadian patients. I do have some disclosures shown here, and I would like to say before I start that, I'll be discussing some emerging treatments that are not currently standard of care. Uh, I would encourage any patient interested in hearing more about these treatments um, in discussing them with your treating team as each patient's situation is quite unique. We will be talking about glioma and a specific subtype of glioma, which is glioblastoma today. Um, as a side note, uh, many neuro-oncologists, myself included, are drawn to the field due to the unique experience of taking care of patients with terminal brain disease. And I, I think this presentation really does not do justice uh, to the provider and patient interactions that, are, that we are quite privileged to. Um, but to really understand gliomas, we need to take a step back and talk about brain tumors in general. So we think about brain tumors as primary brain tumors if they arise from structures in the brain and as secondary brain tumors or brain metastases if they grow somewhere else in the body and metastasize to the brain. Primary brain tumors are overall rare compared to other cancers like lung or breast cancer, but there are still about 27 new cases per day. And of these, glioblastoma, which we also refer to as GBM, is the most common malignant primary brain tumor, and its incidence is about 4.1 cases per 100,000 per year. Uh, as many of you may be aware, the prognosis for glioblastoma is quite poor, so less than 10% of our patients with GBM survive for more than five years. And while GBM is at one end of the spectrum, there are other types of gliomas that have better outcomes. Uh, although strictly speaking, all GBM patients are survival, uh, survivors since the day uh, they are diagnosed, the term survivor has not been widely adopted in our field. And this is possibly due to uh, the poor prognosis of our patients. 
Um, I think this is where groups like CCSN could really help change the mindset. Uh, regardless, I think we all realize that there is a lot more to be accomplished in the field and there have been some important uh, milestones in the past five years that have really changed our understanding and approach to these tumors. So this brings me to the first update. We have now embarked on a new molecular era where gliomas are being reclassified based on next generation sequencing, which is a technology that can help us identify mutational signatures that are unique to specific types of tumors. These markers not only help us provide more precise diagnosis based on sometimes very small amounts of tissue, but these markers are also helpful uh, in predicting how patients will do over time and how they will respond to treatment. So let's take a step back to understand why this is so critical. Um, a diagnosis of a glioma is, of course, life-changing, and it is made uh, based on imaging and ultimately a biopsy or resection. Surgeries can be quite challenging depending on the tumor location, and especially if the tumor is found in an area of the brain that houses vital functions such as language or motor control. Uh, the tissue from a biopsy then gets sent to the lab for review by a pathologist, and prior to 2016, the diagnosis was finalized based on histology and patterns of staining alone, meaning that pathologists would review the slides under a microscope and based on how the cells look like, would make a diagnosis. So for example, certain types of cells look like astrocytomas and other types of cells look like oligodendrogliomas. Uh, this method could be quite challenging even for the most uh, talented pathologists as it relies on making the right diagnosis based on sometimes very small amounts of tissue. So at the same time in the past uh, 10 years or so, there has been an increased recognition, not just in gliomas, but in several other cancers such as lung cancer, GI cancer, and melanoma, that molecular and genetic alterations could not only subclassify tumors successfully, but also give important information on prognosis and response to treatment. So in 2016, the World Health Organization classification of brain tumors issued a major revision which incorporated the use of molecular information uh, to provide a more comprehensive classification. Um, another update uh, is also due later this year in 2021, and changes that are expected include uh, even more inclusion and integration of molecular information. Why this matters is that we now have a better way of coming to a more precise diagnosis uh, for example, these molecular alterations are present in all areas of a tumor and therefore can overcome some of the limitations of a small biopsy. Another example is that occasionally pathologists can have differing opinions uh, based on the slides that they analyze and review using histology alone. And integration of molecular data takes away some of this variability. So it gives uh, quite an objective analysis um, uh, for the interpretation of the molecular and histological information. Um, our pathologists will still have a very uh, key role to play, however, in integrating this information and uh, bringing this to, uh, towards making a good treatment plan. So to better illustrate the role of molecular markers in the current classification of gliomas, I've included this diagram, uh, which is uh, taken from a recent publication from the European Association of Neuro-Oncology. So as you can see here in uh, making a, a diagnosis, the first pass is still based on histology. So we're still reviewing the slides and looking at the cells to see what they look like. And uh, after that, we often uh, rely on what we call the IDH mutational status. So IDH stands for isocitrate dehydrogenase, and that's an enzyme uh, that is uh, part of a pathway uh, that has been associated with early um, formation of tumors. So it is an early driver of glioma formation, essentially. And IDH uh, status, that is whether there's a mutation in the gene or not, has been found to be an important prognostic marker. So it can tell us whether a tumor will tend to be more aggressive or not. We know that these tumors uh, behave very differently from a biological perspective. So we now recognize that IDH mutant and wild-type tumors are very different. 
Um, and there are also other markers seen here that I will not go into that can help with making uh, a distinction in terms of a diagnosis. The other important one that uh, is often mentioned in uh, clinical reports is deletion in the chromosome arm of 1P and 19Q because the signature is associated typically with a diagnosis of an oligodendroglioma. So as you can see, using this algorithm, we're able to then classify um, gliomas into oligodendrogliomas or astrocytomas and often provide a grade as well based on histology. Lastly, uh, the other marker that is worth mentioning is the MGMT promoter uh, methylation. Um, and many of you uh, who uh, have uh, brain tumors would have encountered this in your discussions because we know now that MGMT promoter methylation can be a useful marker in predicting response to chemotherapy in glioblastoma patients. So how do we assess these alterations in tumor samples? There are several techniques, and many of these will continue to evolve with emerging technologies and a lowering cost of sequencing. Uh, terms that you will hear being mentioned are immunohistochemistry, uh, chromosomal analysis, next generation sequencing, and methylation profiling. Uh, we won't go into these in detail today, but I just wanted to mention that while some of these are used uh, clinically, uh, most of them are still uh, only on a research or only done on a research basis and can be quite costly uh, depending on which panels are run and where they are run. An example of how uh, molecular information may be helpful is in the context of targeted therapy, which is a theme we will discuss later as well when we talk about IDH mutant gliomas. Uh, the concept of targeted therapy is that we know that certain mutations are responsible in driving cancer due to altered pathways in certain cells or their supporting structures. So this figure here looks very busy and complex, but essentially shows uh, several cellular pathways that can be altered leading to the formation of glioblastoma. And it also shows how specific drugs could help target these mutations as seen here by uh, the rectangles here. So sequencing with DNA or RNA identifies these defective pathways, and as such, specific drugs could be used to target them. So there are currently hundreds of trials across the world trying to find effective targeted therapy for glioma and glioblastoma, uh, as shown here uh, in the multiple boxes. So to put uh, a specific example to highlight this point, this is uh, a patient that we treated during my time at Dana-Farber. Uh, she was a young patient in her 20s with a glioblastoma with a mutation known as BRAF B600E. Uh, this mutation is also found in melanoma and there has been a lot of experience in melanoma in using drugs that target this mutation. Um, the patient here was started on a combination therapy, and as you can see here on her MRI, this uh, white part here being her tumor, uh, she responded quite well to the treatment and tolerated uh, the treatment quite well with very little side effect. Uh, she sustained this response for over a year. Uh, unfortunately, she eventually progressed, but did, uh, you know, was able to uh, remain uh, progression-free uh, for up to a year on treatment. So the big caveat in the story is that this mutation is present in only about 2% of patients with GBM. So while the response is impressive, it is unlikely that many patients would be able to benefit from this approach, but it is still very important that we screen patients, especially young ones, uh, for this mutation. So should we then be looking for targetable mutations in all glioma patients? Uh, that's a question that I've been thinking a lot about having trained in the U.S. where we were routinely doing sequencing on every single patient and coming to a single peer system where this was less accessible. Um, the NCCN guidelines, uh, which is a set of practice and management recommendations in the U.S. for different cancer types, actually mention incorporating molecular and genetic characterization in the clinical care of gliomas. Um, however, sequencing panels are still not standard of care in Canada and can, can, and can cost up to uh, several thousands depending on the mutations on the panel. And also, while some actionable mutations can be found, 
Uh, they are more common in younger patients with lower grade gliomas, and the targeted therapies that we have available are still nowhere near a home run. Uh, so the actual clinical benefit of these panels for every single GBM patient is still unclear. Um, it's a question that uh, I think we'll uh, continue to study over the course of time, and uh, that's something that uh, I'm particularly interested in uh, delving uh, into a bit more in the coming years. Uh, despite all the current setbacks, I do think that we will need to push for more integration of larger molecular panels in clinical care and glioma for a number of reasons. Uh, first and foremost, I think we need to plan for the future. There are many trials that are investigating targeted therapies, and we need to be ready uh, for when the treatments become available for our patients. And also beyond targeted therapy, understanding of individuals' uh, specific molecular signatures can help inform patterns of response and resistance. So what treatments may work for what types uh, of tumors? And this will really help guide our choice of treatments for patients in the future. And uh, also when talking about costs, it is likely that these uh, strategies and, and you know, sequencing uh, panels will become cheaper uh, to do as the technology becomes more advanced. Lastly, and uh, most importantly, I think it is difficult to talk about cost and value in a population as a whole, um, as opposed to, you know, the individual. And, and I think this is what and who we need to keep in mind. Um, I think if you ask anyone, you can't really put a price on finding a target in a patient who might be an exceptional responder when there is an available drug therapy. So shifting gears now a little bit, uh, I'd like to talk about a second update, which is how we've, adopt, uh, we've adapted the standard of care therapy over time for our glioma patients. In particular, I'll talk about how we are optimizing treatments to reduce side effects and improve quality of life. The standard of care for glioblastoma remains uh, the STU protocol from the landmark trial in 2005, which combines radiation and chemotherapy following surgery. Um, and that uh, combined radiation and chemotherapy course is usually followed by six cycles of temozolomide. Uh, so this trial, uh, which again was done in 2005, showed that the addition of temozolomide to radiation led to longer survival in glioblastoma patients. And the median overall survival, which is uh, a measure of, a common measure that we use in oncology trials, was 14.6 months. So it has now been 15 years since the results were published, but it still remains the current standard of care because nothing else has been found to extend overall survival in comparison uh, in newly diagnosed glioblastoma. Um, another important point to mention is that although I didn't include the survival curves here, this trial also showed that this regimen was particularly effective in the MGMT methylated or favorable group and really validated MGMT as a predictive marker for response to radiation and temozolomide. So over the years, as we can see, unfortunately, um, there hasn't been much progress in increasing the median overall survival for GBM despite advances in technology and available drug therapies. And this is quite dramatic when we compare this, for example, with how survival in lung cancer, melanoma, or breast cancer has changed when targeted therapies have been implemented as a result of molecular subtyping. So we really are in need of our next major breakthrough. So have we made no progress at all? Uh, I think the clear answer is that we have, although at face value, it is true that the backbone of our treatment remains a combination of radiation therapy and temozolomide similar to the STU protocol. Uh, some important questions have been asked, for example, is more better when it comes to the number of cycles of adjuvant temozolomide? And the short answer is no, more has not been shown, at least in a trial setting, to be better. Um, other very relevant and important modifications have also been made to how we treat uh, elderly patients uh, with radiation and temozolomide. So uh, the initial STUP trial back in 2005 did not include many patients over 65 and none over 70. And uh, actually these patients make up most of the patients uh, with GBM that we see day to day in clinic. 
um, a landmark a study led by Dr. James Perry at Sunnybrook with the collaboration of many sites across Canada and Europe um, actually showed that patients that were over 65 could benefit from a short course of radiation and chemotherapy, which was also better tolerated in elderly patients. So this shorter course of radiation and chemotherapy um, as a result of this study has really changed uh, the way we treat elderly patients with GBM across the world. So to summarize our approach to newly diagnosed GBM, as you can see here, age, uh, MGMT status, and functional status are big determinants in the initial discussions between patients and their providers. It is also important to highlight uh, the presence of clinical trial options in these decision-making algorithms. And, and I think this is something that every patient should be aware of. Um, so make sure to talk to their providers at a diagnosis and the time of recurrence as to whether a clinical trial uh, may be an option. And in addition, in the U.S. Uh, tumor treating fields or the opt-in device or an additional option that is now being offered to patients. So what are tumor treating fields? Uh, and many of you have probably seen this online or heard about it through forums from other survivors. I know it is a question that we get quite a bit in clinic as well. Uh, the opt-in device is basically made up of arrays uh, as seen here. Uh, which are stuck to a shaved head, uh, so patients have to shave every other day, and uh, those arrays are attached to a portable battery that the patient needs to wear. Um, so how this works is that there are alternating electric fields that are generated that disrupt cell division in the growing tumor and would therefore cause the tumor to stop growing in theory. So a trial with this device was recently done and completed uh, where the opt-in device was worn by GBM patients for over 18 hours a day after they completed radiation. This trial actually showed that wearing this device prolonged survival by a few months. Um, now, practically speaking, you know, there's a lot of debate over the interpretation of the data, and there are also some day-to-day -day issues uh, that patients have noted related to the device and its wearability. Uh, but I think that overall, these results are quite intriguing, and we're hoping that a trial with the opt-in device starting before radiation will be available to our patients in Canada soon. What about immunotherapy? Um, this is also, uh, at least you know, from a personal experience, a very common question, uh, a very common question from many of our patients. Uh, I think it is worth clarifying that we often use uh, the blanket term immunotherapy, but it actually refers to a lot of different types of treatments in cancer and in gliomas. So basically, immunotherapy refers broadly to treatments that use the principle of leveraging one's immune system to recognize and fight tumor cells. Uh, there are agents known as immune checkpoint inhibitors, and you may have heard of, for example, pembrolizumab or Keytruda, which is used in lung, GI, or melanoma, um, and other types of cancers. Uh, and these agents have not actually been found to be beneficial when used alone in newly diagnosed or recurrent GBM. However, there are many other strategies, including a viral therapies such as a polio virus, uh, vaccines, and chimeric antigen receptor T cells that are being investigated under the same umbrella of immunotherapy. Um, it's very likely that the winning strategy here would be a combination of the above strategies. And we also need to really understand which patients and types of tumor, based again on molecular characteristics, uh, that may have a better response to this approach. So now I'd like to talk about a different area that has generated a lot of excitement in the past years, uh, which is uh, new therapies in IDH mutant tumors. And this really is the poster child, I think, for targeted therapy after identifying a relevant mutation in gliomas. So in particular, I'll be talking about IDH oral inhibitors and vaccine. Just to remind you uh, that in our classification, there is now a clear divide between IDH mutant tumors as seen on the left side of the screen here and IDH wild type tumors or glioblastomas uh, that we just talked about. 
So the management approach uh, to IDH mutant tumors remains quite varied across countries and even across institutions uh, and between practitioners for a number of reasons. Um, that being said, uh, this algorithm here is how we broadly speaking think about uh, treatments for IDH mutant tumors uh, at the moment. So depending on the grade, the age, and some other prognostic factors, one can sometimes wait after surgery to initiate treatment, which is typically made up of radiation and chemotherapy. Um, if patients have um, less favorable uh, prognostic factors, then uh, typically what we decide to do is to start radiation with chemotherapy right away. However, there are still many questions that remain in terms of balancing the need for treatment with possible side effects. And that's because IDH mutant tumors are predominantly a tumor of young adults, and therefore a lot of survivors can carry side effects for many years. Um, these tumors can behave quite indolently and appear radiologically different from more aggressive tumors and can grow slowly. So the right time for intervention can be a bit unclear. Uh, also, we know that removing the whole tumor and um, you know, proceeding with radiation therapy with or without chemotherapy um, prolongs survival. However, we need to weigh uh, the benefits of doing these interventions against the potential uh, neurocognitive side effects and impacts of, on quality of life. And lastly, while there is a clear distinction in prognosis and survival between co-deleted and non-co-deleted tumors, that is oligodendrogliomas and astrocytomas, uh, there is a less clear distinction between what we call histological grading, so a grade 2 versus a grade 3 oligodendroglioma. So hopefully there will be more uh, to come in the coming years to help us guide uh, management for these uh, tumors. Now, there has been great interest in targeting the IDH mutation, as this has been found in gliomas to be an early event leading to tumor formation, as I mentioned earlier. So again, this diagram is a bit complex, but shows the presence of IDH within the typical pathway and how the mutation causes uh, increase in the metabolite 2-HG. Uh, this metabolite um, is associated with tumor growth. Um, so blocking this defective pathway at different levels, as seen here, uh, could therefore in theory reduce the amount of 2-HG produced and therefore lead to a decreased rate of tumor formation. So some of you may have heard of IDH inhibitors, which, which are shown here within that pathway, uh, but there are also PARP inhibitors and other agents that are being investigated in IDH mutant tumors based on these mechanisms of actions and pathways. One particular IDH inhibitor trial that is worth mentioning, as it is open in many centers in Canada, including in Ontario and BC, uh, is the Indigo trial, which is a trial of an IDH inhibitor called voracidinib. So in this trial, patients with an IDH mutation um, can be enrolled in either a treatment arm with voracidinib or a placebo arm, and they need to have surgery without any additional treatment. So they would typically have the surgery to confirm that they have an IDH mutant low-grade glioma and then uh, be able to wait uh, for a few months prior to enrolling in the study. Um, so the preliminary data from an earlier phase one study uh, with voracidinib and another IDH inhibitor, ivocidinib, showed encouraging results as seen here. Uh, and we're actually very excited uh, that uh, our patients have the chance to participate in this potentially uh, practice changing clinical trial. Lastly, very recently, this group in Germany uh, published results from a small group of patients who received a vaccine targeting mutant IDH1, uh, again with encouraging response rates. Uh, of course, larger studies and longer-term outcomes are needed to really clarify the efficacy of such a strategy, but I think this is all uh, pointing towards uh, you know, exciting developments in the field. So what would be the benefit of targeted therapy as compared to our standard of care, which I mentioned earlier was radiation and chemotherapy? Um, early phase studies for both the oral IDH inhibitor and the IDH vaccine suggest quite good tolerability without frequent, frequent significant adverse events. Um, so these would be therapies that patients would 
actually be able to tolerate quite well. And such an approach could also help delay the need for upfront radiation or cytotoxic chemotherapy and reduce side effects from these treatments, which is particularly relevant and important in young patients. And lastly, we now know that some patients who receive long courses of chemotherapy with temozolomide, for example, can acquire high burden of new mutations and develop treatment resistant tumors. So therefore using a targeted agent may actually prevent therapy induced resistance and malignant transformation in these patients. So a better way to address the tumors without causing uh, the risk of malignant transformation in theory. So I know while all the previous updates touched upon precision care in uh, glioma, I also wanted to do a bonus round on some of the other inno uh, innovative strategies that are being developed. And this includes overcoming the blood-brain barrier and some other adaptive therapies or strategies to address some of the challenges we have been encountering in our efforts uh, to find uh, effective therapies. So here are some of the challenges in developing durable treatments for gliomas. So access to the brain is a huge one uh, due to the blood-brain barrier. And we know that the brain and spinal cord are protected from our circulation uh, through the blood-brain barrier. And this interface, uh, which provides this separation, is usually highly selective uh, in the type of compounds that it can allow in. So therefore, many drugs, uh, while they can be successful in preclinical studies in the lab on a cell culture, for example, may fail when tested in real patients. Um, in addition, we know that tumors are constantly changing and evolving, and we're not always able to resample them to get accurate molecular information, as this would entail naturally another surgery in brain tumor patients. So in a feat that was truly groundbreaking in 2015, uh, a team at Sunnybrook led by Dr. Main Prize, Dr. Heinonen, and Dr. Lipsman uh, made history by being the first to open the blood-brain barrier non-invasively. And since then, this team led by uh, Dr. Lipsman, shown here, uh, has been using this technology to develop new treatments for a number of neurological and psychiatric conditions. So the way that it works for glioma specifically is that a chemotherapy drug can be injected or swallowed uh, by a patient. And usually after that, um, tiny microscopic bubbles are injected into the bloodstream of the patient with a brain tumor. And the microbubbles are smaller than red blood cells and they can pass uh, harmlessly through their circulation. Um, so what happens after that is that uh, our neurosurgeon, Dr. Lipsman, uh, uses an MRI-guided focus low-intensity ultrasound uh, that act very similarly to sound waves, essentially, uh, to target blood vessels in the area near the tumor. And these waves cause uh, the microbubbles to vibrate and loosen those tight junctions uh, and open up the blood-brain barrier so that chemotherapy can actually flow through the brain uh, circulation. So this really uh, is uh, exciting as we can now think about using focus ultrasound to help with delivery of uh, many potential active candidates uh, closer to the desired target. And there are currently three trials for brain tumors using focus ultrasound that are open at Sunnybrook, including one for newly diagnosed glioblastoma, uh, one for recurring glioblastoma, and one for CNS metastases. Another innovation that is unique to Sunnybrook is MRI-guided radiation therapy. Uh, and our team, led by Dr. Arjun Segal, has now treated over 150 brain tumor patients with this new technology. Um, so just to give you an idea outside of clinical trials, so in routine clinical care, a uh, patient only has an MRI brain at planning for radiation and another MRI brain four weeks after finishing their course of radiation. So that means that for most patients, they're not being imaged for a course of about 10 weeks uh, during uh, their radiation treatment. So this study called the, the Momentum Study, which is open at Sunnybrook as part of a global consortium, is currently enrolling patients uh, and uses MRI to guide radiation treatments. So having more frequent scans uh, offers earlier detection of progression, which for some patients may mean replanning of their radiation. 
another bonus of this study is that it will also help us understand the behavior of tumors during treatment and how we can use MRI to better understand and predict tumor behavior. So lastly, another innovation uh, that has, has been in the design of clinical trials. So clinical trials in glioblastoma have to be carefully designed and executed in order to ensure that we can draw meaningful, meaningful conclusions as quickly as possible. Um, this is because we want to bring effective agents to more patients faster, but also uh, we want to make sure that patients do not stay on ineffective therapies for longer that is required in a clinical trial setting. And this was uh, historically very hard to do as trials need to be completed or reach certain milestones prior to analysis of data and uh, deriving conclusions. And that is why uh, I think that new trial methods, which analyze outcomes in real time, are particularly exciting. So this trial, uh, the GBM Agile trial, which is now open at the MNI and will soon be open um, at other centers across Canada, including Sunnybrook, uh, is uh, an adaptive trial which will enroll uh, newly diagnosed and recurrent GBM patients. So it has multiple arms to which patients can be randomized. And uh, these arms uh, will be subsequently dropped if the interim results show that they are underperforming or move on to the next trial phase if they are performing well. And new arms can be added over the course of the trial. So overall, this will not only ensure that we have a clinical trial option with promising drug therapies for a large number of our GBM patients, but it'll also allow us to draw conclusions faster uh, to help find the best performing agents. So putting it all together, this is a vision of how precision care in CNS oncology would look like when we integrate all of the parts that I mentioned before, keeping in mind that we're not only working to improve survival, but also quality of life in our patients. So into the last segment of my talk, um, how do we move forward? So research in CNS tumors and gliomas in particular will need to focus on finding better candidate drugs. Um, better modes of delivery for radiation and systemic therapy, and better selection of patients for each specific treatment, and vice versa. So this research at, at the moment remains quite challenging for a number of reasons. Um, so the first one being that CNS tumors remain a rare disease, which means that every patient counts. Uh, our patients tend to have short survival times, which means that every time point counts and every specimen counts uh, in contributing to our understanding of this disease. So we not only need more patient participation in clinical trials, but also in research in general in order to get there faster. Um, trials are often thought of as experiment, but I think uh, this strategy may benefit patients directly in other ways as well. So for example, studies have showed that uh, patients who are enrolled in research studies and clinical trials tend to receive closer follow-up and monitoring and may feel more empowered uh, in some ways to make lifestyle changes that can eventually lead to better outcomes. Um, so it is something I think uh, that every provider needs to discuss uh, with patients if a clinical trial or research study is available at their institution. And regardless, participation remains an individual decision and one in which the patient the and the oncologist need to engage um, in an honest and open discussion and shared decision making. So thank you for sticking with me until the end. And if I could summarize the talk in one slide, I really do think that there's a cause for optimism. Uh, we're getting better at differentiating tumors and providing precision care based on molecular signatures and targeted therapies. Uh, we are getting better at reducing side effects without compromising survival in our patients. And we're also getting better at drug and radiation delivery through newer technologies. And lastly, we are developing better clinical trials and effective research designs. And more importantly, there is much more to come and every patient can help advance the field. And this leads me to my last point. Uh, the cure will likely not be one miracle drug, but rather a unique combination or sequence of treatments individualized to each patient. Uh, and I hope that my presentation today has highlighted that every tumor and every patient 
can be unique and there is a lot that we can learn from each patient's experience. So before concluding, I'd like to acknowledge the CNS Oncology team at Sunnybrook, um, the hard work and innovation of which was highlighted in many areas of this talk. And I would also like to acknowledge all of our collaborators and colleagues treating CNS Oncology patients across Canada. And most importantly, to all of our patients who continue to inspire us to work hard every day. So this concludes my talk and I think we have some time for questions. Great, thank you so much for that presentation. We still have about 15 minutes or so for questions. So if you haven't already submitted your questions, you can still do so, uh, but we have quite a few already. So um, I think we can start going through some of those. Uh, the first question is, at what point do patients get unblinded for the indigo study? That is a great question. So um, as you point out, it is a randomized blinded study. So 50% of patients uh, get treated with the active agent, fluoracidinib, and 50% of patients get enrolled in the placebo arm. So we do have set you know, timelines for imaging that is you know, um, scheduled based on the trial protocol. And if there is any evidence at any point that there is tumor progression, uh, there's the option of unblinding the patient. And if they happen to be on the placebo arm, there is um, an option to switch over to the active arm of treatment for them to access the IDH inhibitor. So it depends on uh, when there is documented progression and whether or not they are on that placebo arm. Uh, next question, how is TMZ resistance identified? Is it simply a lack of regression of disease or is it confirmed molecularly? That is also a, a great question. Um, so we are learning more about temozolomide resistance, and there have been a few papers that have come out in the recent years on temozolomide resistance. Um, so there are a few ways that uh, people can talk about temozolomide resistance. Of course, we talk about it clinically when we see that patients uh, progress on temozolomide. That is sort of the easiest um, way to do this, you know, in clinic, for example. Um, but, you know, in terms of scientific studies that have shown temozolomide resistance, um, scientists and clinicians have actually looked at samples of tissue from patients who have progressed on temozolomide and uh, compared them to uh, their tissue uh, prior to treatment with temozolomide. So occasionally, and, and in a lot of these patients, uh, a specific mutational signature can be identified that corresponds to temozolomide resistance. Um, you know, uh, if you read the papers, they mention a particular mutational signature called signature 11, which is often associated with these uh, uh, tumors. But we also look at other things. So for example, the tumor mutational burden, uh, which is um, identification of the number of uh, mutations per megabase pair uh, within the tumor, it can also be an indicator. Um, there's a lot of work that uh, I'm sure will be coming in that field, for sure. It is quite a hot topic right now uh, in your oncology. Uh, next question, is the uh, foracidinib study available for recurrent brain tumors? Uh, not at the moment, uh, and that is a great question because you know we often wonder about um, how patients will respond to an IDH inhibitor if they failed uh, the standard of care therapy. So ideally, we'd be able to, to study that in that context, but it has not yet been, been done uh, within you know, that time frame. Um, the other option for some patients, and I know we used to do that in the US, is apply for what we call compassionate use of the drug. So apply to get it uh, for specific patients almost as, as a single uh, patient research study. Uh, we have not, and I've tried uh, recently to do that for a patient uh, in Canada, uh, but as far as I know, the drug company uh, is not allowing this type of use yet for recurrent patients. Uh, next question, is focused ultrasound available at all brain tumor clinics in Ontario? So that's a, a great question. So unfortunately, focused ultrasound is actually a very new technology and one um, 
you know, which uh, is starting to really gain a lot of traction in the world. Um, we're very lucky at Sunnybrook in that this was really the birthplace of Focus Ultrasound. Uh, and there are not any, uh, there, there are no other centers in Canada right now that have this technology and capacity. Uh, so I know when I was uh, at Dana-Farber, for example, that we had a focus ultrasound uh, machine and a lot of the work done there actually was based off of the work being done here at Sunnybrook. Um, so Canada really is leading um, you know, the research in focus ultrasound, but unfortunately this is not happening yet at many centers and is only being done, uh, as far as I know, uh, right now at Sunnybrook. Uh, next question, is IDH used for other tumor diagnoses? Um, so within gliomas, you know, that's, that's uh, you know, a common one that we use to distinguish between two types of gliomas. Uh, IDH mutation is also found in certain types of hematological malignancies um, and also in some other solid tumors, but it doesn't have quite the same uh, prognostic significance as far as I know in other solid tumors compared to how it is used in glioma specifically. Um, next question. So uh, was the vaccine that you mentioned, uh, does this aggravate underlying autoimmune disorders such as colitis? Oh, that's a, that's a very good question. So, I mean, technically, anything that involves an immunotherapy uh, can induce a, an autoimmune condition. I think for a lot of these uh, emerging immunotherapies, we will only gain that experience and be aware of these adverse events as more patients are put on the study. So unfortunately, when we uh, do clinical trials, um, I just know from experience for uh, immunotherapy clinical trial, a lot of the time patients with autoimmune diseases will be excluded uh, initially from the trials based on the theoretical risk of uh, exacerbating uh, autoimmune conditions. Uh, but I think, you know, as more data is gathered on these vaccines, we'll be able to tell for sure what the potential impact may be for patients with autoimmune disease. Uh, next question, what would you recommend to do after the six months of standard treatment has been completed? Would you recommend going right into a trial? So, yeah, that's also a very good question. So what we tend to do is after we complete uh, the planned standard of care, you know, course of chemo radiation and six cycles of adjuvant chemotherapy, patients usually enter a surveillance phase. So we scan them every couple of months or so to see if their tumor remains stable. And typically what would happen is that if there is any sign of progression, that would be the appropriate time point to consider a clinical trial. Uh, right now, we do not tend to recommend proceeding with more treatment um, unless there is an indication that there is recurrence on the subsequent scans. Uh, next question, in treating BRAF mutated uh, brain tumors, is there a way to predict which patients will have a response to BRAF inhibitors and which will not? Yeah, so that's also a very good question. I think that's sort of uh, really at the crux of, of all of these trials that deal with very specific mutations. So we know that there are certain patients that will respond very well and some patients that won't respond as well. And we don't know ahead of time which patients these are, especially in rare mutations where the sample size is so small. So I think uh, we will be able to tell uh, more, you know, with regards to which patients may benefit as we gather more experience, you know, collect more patients and analyze, you know, their molecular signatures, their clinical characteristics, and sometimes even their imaging features over time. And again, highlighting the importance of, of research um, and, and, you know, participation in these, uh, um, you know, research studies. Uh, next question, when will data for, for sorry, I keep saying this wrong, for a sit in and study be published? Yeah, so it's still actually uh, actively enrolling, and, and these trials can take years. Um, 
to you know be completed and, and have uh, you know their final results reported. Uh, but these uh, trial results are often analyzed at several time points and you know disseminated in the context of uh, national meetings. So um, you know we're we're always updated in terms of the results, but we won't have the final results, I believe, for a few years. Uh, next question. You mentioned that tumors can become resistant to TMADAR. Uh, would you recommend staying on that for longer than six months? Yeah, so that's always, uh, again, a, a discussion that needs to happen with your primary treatment team because it depends on a lot of things. It depends on the type of tumor uh, that is being treated, what type of glioma it is, uh, what the MGMT status is, and what other treatment options may be. So, for example, as I mentioned, in glioblastoma, we have showed that, uh, I mean, we, we know based on the evidence now that occasionally extending beyond six cycles may not be that helpful. But I know anecdotally, uh, you know, where I was training and even here uh, in Canada, people do go past uh, six cycles if there is a response and patients are MGMT methylated. So I think it can vary quite a bit and, and it really depends on the discussion uh, with the provider in terms of what to do in that scenario. Uh, next question. Do you think that there's anything that can be done to have drugs for uh, gliomas get approved more quickly? Yeah, I mean, that's that's also an excellent question. And I think one in which, you know, uh, patient and advocacy groups will have a big role to play. Uh, again, we are at a big disadvantage in that we are a rare disease. Uh, so there might not be as much, you know, uh, visibility and uh, activism uh, from our end. Um, but, you know, um, it is something that I think uh, we'll need to continue doing and we're always doing uh, in the background. So I think, you know, uh, groups like uh, the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada have been very active in that and, and we need to continue advocating for faster treatment in GBM. No, I really do think that um, we're dealing with an exciting time when it comes to glioma and glioblastoma research for a number of reasons. So again, you know, increasing, uh, you know, advances in technology, a better understanding of the disease, but also, you know, our patients right now are very informed and very empowered and, and are a big part of uh, decision-making when it comes to their care and really drive, uh, you know, those discussions with us in clinic. So I think there'll be much more to come. And again, I, I do look forward to uh, many more years of uh, research and uh, exciting um, breakthroughs in the field. Great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to present with us today uh, for such a very informative presentation um, and for highlighting some new developments in treatment that I think we're all hoping to see um, wide, more widely disseminated. So thank you so much for your time today. And thank you so much, everybody, uh, for taking the time to join us for today's webinar. As I mentioned before, uh, the slide and a recording of the webinar will be available tomorrow and will be sent to everybody. Uh, so if there's anything you wanted um, more details for. So thank you so much, everybody, uh, for tuning in and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you.